All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's Thursday because I keep on forgetting the days. It is MSP Initiative, 1 o'clock Eastern time. Sorry for everybody else who's in different parts of the world, but we record it so you can watch it. We welcome back our uh, top of the thought food chain, <laughs> Dave Sobel. Dave, it, it's been uh, about a month or so since we last talked. How are you doing? I'm good. Nothing at all has happened. George, we have nothing to talk about. Clearly, nothing has happened in a month. Oh, yeah. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I mean, um, it, it definitely seems like regardless of where you are in the world, uh, everybody's having their own challenges. I mean, I heard that Europe kind of gave us you know, a little bit of a black ball from the U.S. perspective. They can open up their, their, their nation state group of countries for you know, multiple areas, except for the U.S. And I heard that Canada might not be opening their border to the U.S. for a year. Yep. It's, uh, we, we are in the same company as Brazil and Russia in terms of traveling to the EU. So uh, that puts it in perspective of where we fall currently in the, in the world order. Oof. <laughs> that's, that's I feel bad for our Canadian friends, especially the people that got caught on the other side of the border when they shut it, right? I don't know. It seems pretty great up in the Great White North right now. <laughs> like they, 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 seem, they seem to be doing all right. So. Maybe, maybe they're going to be pre, uh, trying to prevent people from sneaking across. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they're keeping us out. Fortunes a little bit. Exactly. So since we talked last, uh, one of the main things – in our in our kind of four or five topic list that we talked about was, you know, Erdogan, who was the Secretary of State from Louisiana. He came on with you on a on a like an interview, right? And he kind of right. like put his beef out there, I guess is the right or at least mentality, you know, for for his concerns. Which coming into this was, you know, a lot of their local municipalities or city or whatever were getting just cr crushed right. with air and security type stuff so let's remind the world what this whole conversation was about because this is probably the biggest news that's happened since we talked last yeah so this is this is the big one so, to the backstory on this is and i've been been covering this on my daily podcast the business of tech uh, i've been covering this story as it develops so the, the the initial piece of this is if you go back in time and you look at what happened late last year coming into this year Louisiana as a state was dealing with a large number of ransomware issues across the state at low at the city level at the municipality level they were they were just getting decked <laughs> yeah, yeah, getting... I thought it was like machine gun Dave they like couldn't like get a breather exactly it was really bad the city of New Orleans had to declare a state of emergency they were they you know they I mean essentially they locked down the same way they had to lock down for Katrina to deal with cybersecurity incidents huge set of issues and uh, the Secretary of State, a man by the name of Kyle Ardwan, sat uh, was was the person trying to help run the coordination on this. And as as he did an interview on my show talking about that in back in in March, uh, talking about his experiences there, coordinating with the FBI, and he got really educated on exactly what happens in our space. If you think about all of these little little government agencies, they're little small businesses, right? They're all of the little departments and such like that. And they worked with either in some cases MSPs or in other cases MSSPs. And right. And he quickly understood that there's a real difference in service level but additionally, he is, as the person trying to figure this out, has no insight into the space at all. There's no way for him to know even who exists, much less who's qualified, what standards they're using for implementation. He literally just has to start figuring this whole space out. Now, here's the guy who's dealing with rampant security issues. And he looks out and he sees this just chaos. <laughs> and he says, he says, I, I can't have this, right? This is, a, this is a huge risk. We're all dependent on technology. And by the way, this is all pre-pandemic stuff. So before we all realize that, oh my gosh, technology is so much more important. Uh, this is all in the context of that space. And so he goes, like, I just need to know what's going on. And what's critical to understand is this is a pro-business Republican in a deeply red state. <laughs> like say, right. Saying, uh, what's going on here? I don't like, I can't even understand. So, so he was at the time he was working on legislation that was asking the, to have this, anyone who was doing that have to register. Well, he's 
That law has been passed and signed in into effect starting for February 1st, 2020 of next year. And I'll say, and I report as reported on my podcast <laughs> that released yesterday. Uh, the Now, if you're doing business with any government agency in the state of Louisiana, you have to register with his office mm -hmm. and you have to report any cyber incidents and any ransoms paid within 24 hours. So hold on, Dave. Let, let me rewind for a second just to make sure I'm crystal clear. Sure. This mean, like, could this be I'm offering them a one-off service? Um, you know, I sold them a box of, of computer equipment or I'm just selling them one, like, uh, you know, it could be maybe I'm Office 365. Like, how far, is it everything, anything? Is it has to be a certain threshold? What is this? Look, I am not a lawyer, right? And this, the moment you instantly get regulation, this is the kind of thing that'll get settled over, over time over enforcement. But it's, but it defines broadly provider, it provides broadly, it defines a managed services provider, it defines a managed securities provider, it, it goes into detail and they have written into legislation definitions for our space. Now, look, some will some will go, oh, well, it's only, you know, only those dealing with government, only Louisiana, to which I just say, like, look, people, if you're not paying attention on this one to notice that people are paying attention to technology, I don't think you're seeing the beginning of this trend. So th for me, I look at this and say, and look, be the customers for a moment. How do you know? How do you have any sense of standards, of the kinds of, of information that you need to know to really be able to judge it? Yeah, you can get a bunch of promises in a contract, but really you're only going to find out in execution. And that could be way too late. Right? Well, I, this is that whole operational maturity thing, right? Like, where are you? I know that's like a Paul Dipple thing, right? Where yeah, oh, sure. You are on the scale. But I feel like this is opening up pandora a bit dave because like now they're just saying hey this is a definition if you fit you must register if this happens you must notify this is not the end of this this no is the, <laughs> this is long, dark hole here this is the beginning <laughs> this is the beginning look i you know i i i think this is this is and, and you get it i totally understand from the perspective of customers saying, this is just chaos. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I really take the lens of thinking about this from the perspective of other industries. Think about this if we were all doctors. And we could just anybody declare that they're a doctor. This is the wild west. We're back in the, or the 1800s out west and we could just hang up a shingle and I could perform surgery on you, life-saving surgery on you. Yeah. Yeah. You're not really that comfortable with that idea, are you? <laughs> no, no. No, I mean, listen, if I got into DeLorean, I, go, I went to Back to the Future Part 3, and then, like, it was the Wild West, and, like, it's, hey, the blacksmith's also the, uh, the doctor. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, at that point, it's the only person available. Now, I mean, it's a, they're super regulated, right? They got to go through a lot of schooling. They got to test out. It's like lawyers, right? Right. Uh, but in our industry, Dave, in, in IT, like, there's certifications, okay? And, and, sure. And there's competencies, right? Depending on vendor, but right. there's no body, right? There's like CompTIA and a couple of other like situations like that, but there's no body that says you are who you said you were, right? Right. Well, so, and, and there's lots of people. So, and, and I got, I've been working on this and, and uh, so I've, I've actually, my Patreons have now got access to a video that I've done detailing this and it'll be, I'll be releasing it on Monday to the wider community. Okay. Uh, but, but, you know, so, so I dive into exactly this, the, there's pieces of this all around the industry. But if you look historically at the way doctors, the way lawyers, the way accountants have all happened, history really gives us very clear indication of the way this works. Mm -hmm. So in the legal profession, for example, you know, legal the lawyers were just orators in the ancient Greek days. They moved through, they were you know, done through universities and some kind of you know, informal training. Then they had some a dis determination that coming together socially was the original bar. Like right. the original bar were a lot like the way we think of peer groups and, the and bar, right? right. 
But right, well, it literally was social groups with no accountability. But as the as the industry matured, they recognized this need to hold to some level of professionalism. They created the standards, and then now the American Bar Association here in the U.S. is it is an example of that. They're the ones that coordinate for all the state bars, right? It's a very clear model that the industry came together for some kind of self regulation that then government said, okay, great, that's how we wanna run this, is we want the marketplace to self-regulate, but we're gonna give the stamp of approval and make this an actual thing. You see that with doctors too, by the way, yeah. American Medical Association, you mm -hmm. see it with certified public accountants. It's this, it, there is a very clear historical precedent for this. And by the way, I've always said, if you go back, anytime I appear on this, we can go one of two ways as an industry. We could go like the doctors, the accountants, the lawyers, or we go like the car mechanics, the plumbers, and, you know, and, the, and another version of that where they have accreditations and certifications, but anybody can still fix your car, right? Yeah. <laughs> In this case, no, you know, they did, the, you know, in Erdogan and Louisiana specifically, right? And there's 49 other states, but, and obviously other countries. But in this case, there was no um, association or, you know, trade union or, or anything like that in the mix. The government decided to step in and just create their own umbrella, right? Their own. Yep. We, we as an industry let this happen to us. Mm. We let this happen to us. We didn't, we, we, we didn't, we avoided it. We didn't, you know, we didn't talk about it. We didn't engage on this. We didn't take regulation seriously. We didn't take self-accreditation seriously. We did not address this. How many times have we all talked about unprofessional, uh, unprofessionalism in our space, people just doing what they want. Anybody can hang up their shingles. We all bemoaned it, but nobody yeah. did anything about it. Well, that usually came up in one scenario or another, right? One, it was a headline that turned into a lawsuit, right? Like right. one of the examples I remember was the guy was servicing the local chamber of commerce. You know, they wouldn't give up the Office 365 password. They took yep. it to court. The guy ends up shutting his business down or, or stuff like that, right? Or the other right. side is you hear all these guys in, in the online forum saying, hey, you know, this other MSP won't play game. We can't get access to anything. It's a cluster, right? And then it just right. becomes a ball that, that unwinds. Right, but if we had basics, basic codes of ethics, right? Mm -hmm. In the Hippocratic Oath for IT and the people in an association had accountability to that. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, but we can have certain basic rules of this, standards of data management and data protection. We have frameworks, right? We have things like the NIST secure, cybersecurity framework. We, can, we have all of the pieces of this. CompTIA has got elements of it in their trust marks. MSP Alliance has elements of it in their certification. Like all of the pieces are here for us to assemble. We really need to be at the point where people need to start pulling them together because one plus one really is three in this kind of circumstance. Imagine if we combine powers of this. You combine CompTIA and you combine them with I don't know, MSP Alliance, and then they come together with a distributor because by the way, distribution has a real role to play here. They already do examination of businesses for credit worthiness. Mm -hmm. Like we've got all of the pieces are scattered around our industry. But the trick is solution providers are going to have to be the ones to push for this. Right. Because otherwise, I, I'm saying it's going to happen to us if we don't get involved. And that was the thing I was thinking about, Dave, here. Like, this is one state, Louisiana, and every other uh, every states have breach notification laws yep. and other things in right. place that aren't specific to being an MSP or an MSSP, right? But like, right. this kind of broke through that glass. And I'm wondering, do we have enough time to you know, pull the box back together? Or has Louisiana just, you know, took a sledgehammer into the wall? And now we're going to see these other states just follow right through that. Well, so I'll reference, again, the interview that I did with the secretary. He's specifically saying he wants to work with industry. He, okay. he, he said it in the interview. I want to work with industry. I want this to be a collaborative effort. Like, I, I know you have the expertise. I know you have the capability. But then he also says, if I have to, I have to protect businesses, the economy, and the American people. Mm -hmm. We can work with them or they can 
move on us. <laughs> it's, because, because ultimately, think about what he in government is in task with doing. His right. job is to protect the economy, businesses, the American people. How do you do that? You've got to look out for these danger zones and do something about it. And we have a real threat here. When we're talking about security, this you and I both know this is such an intense, real threat. And I think I could make a pretty strong argument. Security is a big word, Dave. I mean, it's like IT. What does that mean? Or like marketing, right? Like it's a very, like t that means different things to different people, right? Well, sure. But even if I dive straight into ransomware, if I go right down to that specific, I think I could make a pretty good case we're losing that battle. Yeah, for sure. We're, well, right. <laughs> because people are, people are paying the ransom. And I think, that, I do think people, I do think there has been a good shift where people have understood the real need for uh, liability, cyber liability coverage. I think sure. that, that conversation is happening. But, you know, when, and then, hey, if there's an incident, engage that vendor before you start going crazy, right? right? But, let, but let me make this really concrete for people. Let's make this a physical incident. Okay. If gangs were breaking into businesses mm -hmm. and taking hostages and demanding ransom, yes. do we really think that the government would allow it to sit back and have that happen? No. No, there's movies on this. <laughs> right. So, so why do we think it's different if it's, if it's technology? This is literally what's happening. Gangs of criminals are breaking into businesses, taking weapons, holding it to business owners' heads, and saying, pay ransom. I never thought of it in that context. But yeah, you're right. I, I mean, data <laughs> has a value. For sure. Well, exactly, and and it's exactly that. I mean, look, we've we've seen this th this trend for a decade. NATO declared cyberspace a domain of war a decade ago. I was doing really? presentations on this. Oh, absolutely! In the NATO agreement, an attack, a cyber attack on one country, is an attack on all. It's defined the same way as warfare. We're losing this battle, and let's call it out. Like, of course they're going to step in. And I'm looking at this, this whole trend, and I'm saying, look, if we don't get our act together and do something, it will happen to us because, it has, because customers are going to demand it. And I think we – I actually would say, and I want to turn this for a moment, I am actually – and you laughed at me right before – I'm pro-regulation. Here's why. I was, I was totally surprised to hear that because I would say most people feel anti-regulation. Yeah, they're not looking at it right. Who commands great salaries? Doctors, lawyers, and accountants. <laughs> they, are a they, have, they, have a, a regulate, they have some regulation to it. It is self-governed through, you know, through their own expertise. I would love to command the prices and respect at the table that accountants and lawyers and doctors do. That seems like a great place to be. Why wouldn't I embrace that? The extra certification, the ability, the accreditation. Like we always bemoan not being at the table, right? It definitely gives them the ability to charge more. I'll give you that. Like, Love it. <laughs> you can't go to a CPA and spend less. I mean, if you're spending sub hundred dollars, you got the wrong guy. Like, right. I'm and afraid if you, you're, it's a sideshow. Yeah. Right. So why wouldn't we want to be in that place? Why wouldn't we want to be the accountant that commands just a great respect and has that distinction and you have a very public level of, you know, validation and certification from the marketplace? I love this model. Hmm. <laughs> Let me sign me up to command doctor prices. Yeah, but usually, Dave, uh, let's, let's not get, get away from the reality that um, compliance usually means cost right like usually when you're forced to do additional things it comes at a price point right, right am i missing right. that i mean well, okay isn't there a trickle down on that though like if sure, you but, have to pay for it doesn't your end customer pay for it too like yeah and already working in all those other fields yeah see, Seems to be working pretty well there. <laughs> Look, and, and again, this is not like this problem is going away. <laughs> it's, if, we, if we do nothing, the exact scenario I just described to you still happens. Like, like okay. I don't think we have an option of doing nothing. I really don't. 
So, so, okay. You're telling, uh, maybe this is in your podcast, so I don't want to. <laughs> no, people, people, I know people are going to sign up and listen. Cause I, cause I I'm hope so. I'm stuff. listening. That, you know, so, <laughs> so let me, let me ask this question then. Is this a, do we try and, you know, is, is the play here, we need to tackle this at the federal levels and then have that trickle down to the state level? Like, what is the resolution here other than getting blindsided with every state coming up with their own version? Yeah, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good question. And I actually think that we could look at it in, in we really can draw the lessons from these other spaces. If you think about uh, the way the bar runs or the way the, me the medical associations work, they do certifications at the state level, but okay. they have reciprocity by having a national organization help work on it. So for example, if I'm a, if I'm a doctor, right, if, I, if I get my, my medical degree, I, get, I pass, the, you know, pass the exam, I get accredited, that doesn't mean that I can only practice in Virginia where I live, you know, for example. Mm -hmm. I, can, I have the ability to transfer that based on reciprocity and based on, on that need. Now, we could also look at the legal profession, right? For the bar, you generally pass based on a particular state, mm -hmm. but you have the ability to apply that in different states. Now, I personally am going to skew toward federal because I think it's better for us as a state because it's much, or as, as like a, as an industry, it's better for us as an industry because when I think about privacy laws and I think about the way they're applied, it would be so much easier for most of us because state boundaries are just too hard. Think about the way we're enforcing California's new privacy laws, right? So California has all these laws, but the rest of us, I live in Virginia, but that still means I got to think about California, all the way on the other side of the country. Okay, now, you know, now I'm still affected by their laws. I think we're probably trending towards something that's more federal, but I like this hybrid, I, the, way, the way other industries have done it, where we can kind of manage the accreditation maybe at a local, local state level, but apply it nationally. Maybe we can get good enough to do it. I'm not, I am by no means an expert here, but I, I would go in our industry, we've got a bunch of people that are, <laughs> who, who should be able to work collectively to solve this problem. No, you're absolutely right. So, you know, basically the idea is, hey, we should get the industry bodies together. We should go to the Senate or the Congress, right? And say, hey, we want to open up this conversation now so that we're ahead of it. And here's how we want to approach it and yeah. see if they can pass something so that that trickles down to the state level. Yeah, it's, and, and this is where we're, we're now going as an industry. We're going to have to, to push for this and figure out, I, I asked the question in, in this video that I've, I've released is who will lead us? <laughs> you know, like who are the groups that can do this? And I think it's more than just one. I think this is a combination, but I really do look at this and say, I'm looking across the industry and saying, we have the pieces. I don't think this is impossible, but it's going to require collaboration and it's going to require a demand from us as solution providers to push for this. So this is good. We, we have a couple of people that pointed out uh, like Alan Miller here Illinois yep. has a biometric privacy law. Uh, New York has this new Shield Act. Yep, <laughs> um, we, we all kind of are a peripheral around this topic at some level, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Like, yeah, we're we're this. It's ha and again, it's happening to us, and so I will. I think it is time now. This. If you didn't catch it before, because I, I have to laugh and go, I've been, I've been warning about this for ages now, everybody. Now it happened. Uh, now, like if, if, you're not, if you're thinking, oh, this doesn't affect me, you are not watching the trend on this one. And I think it is important to step up. Now, and I, I've talked to a couple of business owners on this who are with me on thinking the, this is an elevation moment. This is an opportunity to really take those businesses and those owners who are looking to grow their business, looking to certify the next level to say, yeah, I can run with this. I can help establish this. I can take my own business to the next level and get that higher value. So it doesn't, but this crosses a couple of pieces though, Dave. So like privacy laws you mentioned, right? Yep. There's also government agencies, right? You mentioned NIST and the user coming out from like the FBI and yeah. different government agencies, right? But then the, the actual 
criminal component, right? Which is somebody stole your stuff or somebody's yeah. old stuff. So like there's multiple angles to this. It's not just, uh, you know, our own, you know, view of, hey, how do we verify somebody's actually doing, you know, who they say they are from a technology firm? All these yep. other components now feed into this. Yeah, totally. And and it's why it's it's got to be, I really do look, again, I'm looking at the history and the other markets and I'm saying, this is what associations do in our industry. And there's tons of players that could do it. The peer groups could do it. The distributors have communities. I've named CompTIA, MSP Alliance, ASCII. Like, there is, there are lots of people that could do this, that could step into this, into this need and help us fulfill it. And I think they're stronger when they start coming together. You know, I, I really look and I say like, you know, Ingram's got an amazing set of communities, right? And they've, I've even said they've got this ability already to do credit checks and stuff. So they've got a piece of this. You know, I could see distribute like an Ingram working with, CompTIA or working with MSP Alliance, like it's the collaboration where we start pulling these together and it starts working and we as the solution providers have to push for that. Well, it's definitely worth um, bringing these, these, I would love to hear from a person from CompTIA or MSP Alliance or, or ASCII. And I would love to hear from the people who run these organizations on their, their, their idea of where we're at and what they're willing to do. I mean, if we don't push, if they're not willing to push the agenda, I feel like, it, you know, we're going to be behind, right? I mean, well, we're already agree. behind. But. So, well, I think I would agree we're behind, but I don't think we're, we're fatally behind. I think we're in a position where it's like, okay, come on, we've had the wake-up call. Let's get, let's get moving. But we're an industry capable of that. We're totally capable of that. We move, we deal with change all the time. This is a an agile community. This is one that can respond. There's an obvious need. There's tons of benefit. Like I'm looking at this going like, this has all the right bits. <laughs> we just need to start doing the work. So I'm, I'm saying, you know, hey, I'm the one here say, saying, putting out the information, trying to start the conversation. You know, that's why I'm, I'm out here talking to you. I did the podcast on Wednesday. I've got a video calling all this out, you know, that, that's, come, that's uh, you know, it's, it's available to my Patreons now. It's avail going out as a podcast episode on, sa on Sunday, and it will be released to the public on Monday so that there's a way to get this kind of information out. And you can, you know, it's out there for the community to start the conversation first, to share it with those saying, yep, we need to get moving on that, to start saying, you know, and, and this is where I, I also smile with knowing, you know, saying as solution providers, we're the customer of everybody else. We're the customer of distributors. We're the customer of the vendors. We're the customer of all of these communities. As the customer, we can ask for this. We yeah. can demand this. We can say this is something that we want and that you must do. It's simply on us as the customers to demand it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, now's the good a time as any, right? Where we're still kind of on quasi lockdown and people are super available, right? <laughs> Where they start like bouncing around and, and travel opens up a little bit. Now's probably a good time to, you know, facilitate that conversation. I'd love to see what happens after your Monday kind of flare. That's what I call this. Well, it's, 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 it's just adding more stuff to, you know, I'm trying to add more value to the community and give everybody something to leverage to use the way they need to. That's, that's the value I'm trying to add. Fair enough. All right. So that's the big hairy story since we last. <laughs> yeah, if, if only we're going to have just one, right? Like <laughs> it's definitely more for sure. What, what else, what comes underneath of that? You know, what have you talked about since then, since March, uh, that comes behind this story? Well, George, I do five podcasts a week, three stories a day. So the other one that I, I keep looking at is, is if I would be, feel like I would be remiss to my service to the community if I wasn't observing that I continue to be worried about the next 12 to 18 months for, okay. the, spa for the space. Because, and, and the reason is, is that I really think about this from, from the perspective of the solution provider community, my best effort is to make sure that everyone is well informed to handle what I consider to be very turbulent times to come. You know, I, 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 I hope. I mean, Dave, it's very turbulent times. This is not a, a drive by comment. It's a bold statement. Right. And, and I, and I start saying, but like, I, cause, cause I look at it this way. If I'm wrong, I will happily eat crow. 
I will come on your, I will come on every show that wants to have me and I'll say, yeah, it's totally wrong guys. And if I'm right, I can go, I did my best to warn everybody. The data tells me we're in for a rough time. We were laughing right about the, about, at the beginning of this. Oh, we can't travel. Can't, we can't go to Europe. The Canadians aren't going to let us come in. Like, this should tell us a little something about the state of the world. I look and say, like, I think when, when you dive into, I did some coverage of some data diving into the why of the, of the current recession and what's causing this. What's unique about this recession is that it is entirely driven by damage to the services industry. Normally, a, normally a recession is driven by the by damage to durable goods. Like people aren't buying refrigerators and appliances, and kind of manufacturing slows down. This is really unique because of the damages to services. So generally, hospitality, restaurants, like you know, travel. You see all of these services businesses really damaged. Well, because right? I was going to say the, the the most recent report showed that retail's up dramatically. I mean, the right. Big guys for sure and yeah exactly yeah. and the other thing about this is that that's pretty unique is, is that the credit situation credit is not the problem the banking system is not damaged we've had previous times where the bank you know banking was the problem it was difficult to get bank, money yeah. we're not lacking for credit or the availability of of financing like that this is a unique set of circumstances additionally some harvard researchers had put out some data talking about how it's disproportionately affecting richer zip codes that actually what when you when you dive into where the services damage is, is it happens much more heavily in zip codes where the where there are richer people essentially think mm -hmm. this through right people with money are not spending money on these services they're not going to restaurants they're not going to to concerts they're not able to spend on sporting events like People with money are not spending on that. That is then damaging the services industry that affects all of that. I want to say, you know, it's it, and versus poorer zip codes where the damage is far less because those were not necessarily part of the economy as it goes. That I don't believe that anybody can tell me that with all of these unknowns that it's just gonna be fine really fast. Like, I just don't buy it. <laughs> like, I'm, I just don't buy it. And I don't buy that we're understanding of the, this well enough because you can't tell me that we have this much unemployment and this much damage to spend that won't flow through the economy to the rest of, of it. You just can't convince me of that. You don't, you don't think all the government, pro, they're already talking about another round where everybody's going to get another 600 or $1,000 check and they're going to, you know, kind of boost like some of the travel, you know, like the different sectors. You don't think any of that helps or? I think it helps. I think we don't have good data on where it's all going. We don't know for sure that it's hitting the right places. We don't necessarily know that if it's, if it's doing all the right things. I'm not saying that they're not worth doing because I actually do think that we need to be doing the heavy lifting to, to make sure that we're doing our part on this. I just am, I'm just looking at this going, there's too many unknowns for me to say, ah, oh, it's going to be fine. Now, I want to qualify that with a couple. The reason I'm raising the alarm on this is because that I want people to do the difficult exercise of looking at their business and understanding what a 30%, 35% impact it does to their business. If I wipe away 30% of your MRR because those customers are damaged and go away, either damaged, what does that do to a business? I the data 21 I think it's 2112 group put out the data saying most solution providers only have about 3 months worth of cash on hand mm -hmm. to handle the downtime. That's scary close, right? That's scary close because if I say I don't think everyone's going away. I think they're going to be damaged. So if I take away, let, let me just do a simple version, right? Every one of your customers sticks around, but they all are damaged a little bit. And so they, they, they each trim and everything, yeah. and everything trims. Has the business, as a business owner, properly modeled that out over time? 
We've talked about service leadership. They've got, and I'll say it again, they have this amazing rapid recovery guide guide to help people under, to, to do their projections. They've modeled out what the impact on revenue to a solution provider is. It takes like three years to get your revenue back to where it was in 2019. My 12 to 18 months seems kind of right in line with those projections. Wow. Because, here, because here's again why I'm being this way. If you do the work, if you do this piece and you do the planning and you understand and you're working that way, you are better prepared to deal with this. This is sure. not, you know, this is my, what, third downtime, you know, third, because I, I dealt with the, you know, the, the one around 2001. I dealt with the one, the, the one in 2008. Okay. You know, this kind, it took a while. <laughs> it took a while for things to put together. But, think, but, to, but to your point, I feel like the difference in this one versus the last two, and you've already said it, but I'm going to re-hit it again, is that there's money available, right? And it's right. very accessible and it's low interest. So, so you should be, this is why I'm saying, like you want to make sure you're planning. I want you to be very, very strategic on the way that you're leveraging these pieces, you're thinking about it, and you've got a long-term plan to this. If you sit down and you model and say, you know, I understand what a 12 to 18 month hit looks like, I've done that projection, now you can start managing to those numbers and to those budgets, and you can react very agilely. I'm also gonna say, I'm not saying don't spend. I'm not saying don't invest. I'm not saying stop marketing and, and hide in your, in your hole. What I'm saying is just make sure that you're deliberate. Everything is, is, you're taking a moment and thinking about this. This feels really intense, right? The time has been crazy. Sure, yeah. It's, we're talking, it's July 2nd. We're yeah, it's I, I, the year has, I mean, Right. For a minute but, there, I felt like we were in the classroom and I was watching the clock tick down. Now yeah. I feel like the year's half behind us and I look up and I'm like, really? It's Ju July, okay. But it's, yeah. only, it's only like three months. We've been at yeah. this kind of three months. Like you put it in perspective, like it's only three months so far. Yeah. We're, we're, you, you have a little bit more time than you think you do. <laughs> it feels really intense, but we're only three months in. You got time. You can take you can take some deliberate pieces. I'm not saying don't move. Please don't think that I'm ever saying like either to just sit and wait or I'm saying move. And I'm actually believe that there is that those businesses that are deliberate, that focus on cutting the fat, that are aggressive, they're gonna be lean and mean and they are gonna be awesome coming out of this like i am i i totally look at this and say this is your chance to really focus on that precision and be a an execute and i don't get don't get me wrong i think there is opportunity out there i just don't want to start by saying there's all this opportunity knock yourself out <laughs> like, you know what i'm saying is is be make sure that you've planned execute against your plan and make sure that you're thinking of the long term on this as private businesses we have the opportunity to do that i don't have to do a quarterly report to investors i don't have to like i don't have to to cough up the you know, information on this on the stock i can take a long-term view of this and say i'm going to be lean i'm going to be mean i'm going to perform i'm going to make sure that i'm disciplined and man i'm going to be strong no, oh, fair enough. And, and there's some smart, I mean, listen, uh, Alan Miller comes back and says, hey, Ben Folds noted, so far we've had 1918, 1930, <laughs> 1968 crammed into three months. I agree with you, Alan. Uh, and, um, I do too, and I do too. And he's completely <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think that there's a lot, I mean, the good part is that there's a lot of communities out there that are, have hammered on this point. Uh, like MSP CFO is a good friend of the, you know, of yeah. the, initiative and he's helped with you know like different financial excel charts and models and plug in your numbers i mean so there's a lot of resources out there to help people do this because i think some people who aren't at, you know and maybe their business isn't large enough they never had to, to forecast model like that far yeah. into it yep. so i think that there are a lot of great tools but to your point uh i feel like where you would usually evaluate this on a biannual or annual basis you're probably gonna have to like get really more repetitive about this exercise, right? Yeah, I think I think so. And it, but look, this is a good muscle to develop, right? If you're not good at this, well, first off, you have to be right now. This is really important. But this is a really critical muscle. It's okay. Embrace it. Start executing against this. Be disciplined. You know, take it take it seriously. And again, if I'm wrong, 
it's still a great exercise, right? Uh, we'll, you're we'll, gonna, remind, you, we'll, we'll tell you, Dave. I'll make please. sure. To... <laughs> I, have, I don't need to be right. I need to make sure that we're all going in the right direction. Like, it's sure. okay. It's, this is, it's not about my ego wrapped up in being right. I'm just, look, I, look, I'm a data guy. I'm a science guy. I'm looking at all of this and I'm saying, this just looks like really messy data, you know? Yeah. And, and when I, every time I've placed bets on my insights in, into data, I've done reasonably well. So this is my recommendation right now. Okay. And well, to Victor's point, my bet is that the NFL is going to have a season. What do you think, Dave? I am, le- I'm a baseball guy. And so I actually think I'm going to get some games and not a season. Um, <laughs> and so, but, but it's the, you know, but, but I'm actually trying to be super Zen about it and say, let's enjoy what we get. Right. Okay. If we get some, if we get some games, if we get pieces of it, let's enjoy those, uh, and let's not get so hung up on the entire arc of it. I've I've done some conversations around the idea of the Stockdale paradox. If you remember uh, earlier conversations, this is the idea. Oh, look at that! He's he's ready. You're ready to go. I'm ready. See that right on, Victor. The idea. If, if you're not familiar with the story, this is the the. Uh, Stockdale was the, the longest running prisoner of war during the Vietnam times. And he it came out and he was interviewed by Jim Collins talking about what really helped him survive there. And he said, you know, the, the paradox you have to, to reconcile is the reality of your current situation without ever losing hope. You have to know that it will end and things will get better. And that's the paradox you've got to hold at the same time. But when he was asked, well, who were the ones that didn't make it? He goes, oh, the optimists. And he go, what do you mean? And he go, well, the, the guys that kept assigning a date. Oh, we'll be out yeah. by Christmas. Oh, we'll be out by Easter. Like those are the guys that didn't make it because their heart was broken when it didn't happen. Well, I didn't realize that 1918, that whole pandemic lasted for three years. I didn't, I thought it was a one year thing. It was actually three years. It's a three year thing. And, and in fact, you know, and, and we've got to correct some the fastest previous, I think I've said this on your show before, the, the fastest previous creation of a vaccine took four years. Yeah. Now we know that we know it's moving faster. There's way more resources. We have way better technology, but we just need to just take a long-term view of this. It's okay. It's going to, it's going to be okay. Take absolute pleasure in the things that are happening, that your opportunities to do that. We've had some amazing weather. The skies are great. They're clear again. I'm, you know, I'm a Nats guy. The Nats Yanks uh, matchup for opening day sounds awesome. Uh, I've never would have seen it. I'm going to enjoy that game and I'm not going to stress about uh, the larger arc. I'm, are you, I'm in are it. you a bandwagon Nats fan, Dave? Because they just won, or are you actually a Nats fan? I was at opening day in 2005 when the Nats played <laughs> the Diamondbacks and RFK, and the, <laughs> so I right. was a season ticket holder the first four years. So okay. I'm I'm all in. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna take away that. We might see a season. It may not end. How about that? We'll get yeah, some. Yeah, exactly. Exa- we're going we're gonna to get some. So enjoy it. Enjoy, what, enjoy okay. the bits that we're going to get. So a couple of follow-up topics so, so we can move to the next one. Alan said, hey, treatment options are improving every week. If you figure out a vaccine, it will take years. Pushing, uh, catching this out by months will dramatically improve your chances. Totally yeah, agree. So, oh. Alan, you're, t- you're totally right. And I actually, I would, I would say, well, I would anticipate, you know, I'm no doctor either. I'm not a lawyer nor a doctor. I expect we're going to have some treatment things that get, that get much better. We're going to be talking about managing this versus, you know, pure cure. But again, we, we just need to be, we need to be patient and deliberate. And Victor, I mean, college football, hey, if, if it doesn't happen, man, that's a bummer because I know like there's, uber college football fans i'm more of an nfl guy myself but i sure. know people who live for college football and if it doesn't happen i mean i've heard of entire teams getting tested for covid positive which isn't great but yeah uh, i'm with you victor so let's pivot to this <laughs> one tiktok chinese mall app collecting data on the entire u.s population dave i'm shocked shocked i say <laughs> like so i mean look these these businesses are already in the data collection business. Google's in that business. Facebook's in that business. Shocking that they're that that this company is in the data collection business. We, of course they are. 
Like, of course they are. But they were saying that these guys put in, like, suits, you know, they, they were cutting corners in their app to, like, steal data from other apps and, like, really take in all your stuff and piggybacking on APIs from other apps within the Apple, iOS, and Android. Yeah, and they're not, and they're, and they're not alone. Because if you, when you dig into the particularly the clipboard issue, you find that other developers are saying, oh, yeah, we knew about that. We use it, too. Uh, the, the, again, this, so this, I, I want to say that my, this is what these tech companies are doing that is damaging public trust in general. Public trust in technology is down 20 points since 2016, where we were considered a benefit to society by about 70%. And now it's dropped to about 50% of people are saying that, we're, that technology is a benefit to society. This is the consequence of that. Now, I want to say that I actually think there is real opportunity here for solution providers to help customers understand what data they're collecting, be disciplined about helping their customers make sure that they're only collecting what's necessary, giving them insight and transparency, and then helping them say that to their customers. Like, I think that there is, I think there's going to be a real pushback uh, by the public to look for companies that do transparency. And this is an area where solution providers should be able to shine, to really get into some business value style stuff about data management beyond just compliance. Compliance is reactionary. But if yeah. you make the way you manage data a competitive asset, man, I think that's a huge opportunity because I think we're seeing smart companies at the t in those larger levels are going to pivot. They're going to actually start getting into figuring that. You can already see it with Apple. Apple is already is differentiating itself from the other big tech players by focusing on a an appearance of privacy. They've embraced that. Their features around that look we could have a whole debate. We could have a whole debate around whether or not it's true. But you can see that they've said, "How do we stand out? We're going to compare ourselves to the other guys by making privacy a bit." I think solution providers have the same opportunity. And let me observe: we all talk about like business value, right? And like go up the stack. That's up the stack. Like you talk about data management and helping a customer truly manage the way that their information is done. That's business value way beyond infrastructure and basic security. Like we're getting into real high value stuff here. So I look at- I feel like the market will eventually have to deal with that with the laws coming down and everyone eventually, right? I mean, yes. you said so, California, but California- you know, they said that their their privacy law very much was almost, you know, copied back and edited from the, um, you know, the European, you know, laws, right? Data protection. Right. Yeah, so exactly. I feel like it's coming. So be a leader. This, that, and that, so anytime you think something is coming, if you're a leader and, and a first mover in this space, then you're, you're the one setting the, the tone, you're setting the direction, you're setting the pricing. <laughs> like you're, you're able to come in the true value. I look at that space and go, it's super interesting. I did a, a video recently called, if I was an MSP, what would I do? If I was starting an MSP, what would I do today? One of my Patreons had asked me, so Dave, you, know, you, you ran an MSP or a vendor. If you were to start one, what would you do today? And I went through the whole exercise of how I'd build that business, assuming I had no legacy, right? Because the joy of if you started an MSP today, I got none of the legacy baggage. Right. And it's, it's a fascinating exercise in thinking about what that would be, but it also the end result is you have this theoretical competitor to think about. So it's a really interesting approach to say, if that company sprung up, how would I be competing against them? And so it, it's, a, it's an interesting piece. It's on my YouTube channel. If people are interested in, in that analysis and what it's all done, you know, that, that's what I've been up to with my spare time. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, like you, you know, the last time I thought, you know, I remember the conversation where it was like, hey, you started your IT MSP in 2000s. And right. then you heard in like post 2010, the born in the cloud, right? right. Now fast forward, we're in 2020. It's like, like Uber that, right? Where it's like, they didn't buy any of the same tools. They didn't go to any of the same routes. They started completely different, right? So yeah, exactly. It does, it does it, uh, less, less moving parts, less vendors, more standardization. I mean, that's, I, I assume that's where it starts. It's a piece. That's a piece of it. It's also about, I would put business, a business application at my core offering. I would be saying like, I'm going out where I'm a, I'm a ninja in 
Salesforce or in, in my, and I talk through the, the, my local dynamics and how I would make a determination on my local market. I probably focus on associations because I'm in the Northern Virginia area serving DC, big space for associations. So I'd be like a ninja at, at you know, association management software. And I couple my successes to them and a business metric. I increase revenue, increase membership, higher spend. Like I'd be c- coupled to that. It's almost like, money ball dave you're working backwards from the math right i mean that's, you're like hey that's how my brain works this many on base yeah like it's the same thing you're working backwards from that it's pretty interesting if anybody anybody who listens to me knows that i'm like a data nerd i'm constantly pouring over these reports to say like what can i figure out move what move can i make based on this data that i'm seeing yeah no that's very interesting so uh, you know, we're kind of in the, the stretch here, uh, you know, so current events, you know, listen, we've had a lot of, there's been a lot of stuff, even in the last week, right? You know, acquisitions by major companies like VMware just bought a DC, you know, D- DCB, you know, backup type solution, Salesforce bought something to compete with ServiceNow. I mean, there's a lot of vendor movement right now. I assume because uh, it's zero, zero percent interest rates. No, uh, no. Shrug. I, you know what? I, I sort of don't care on this anymore because, because look, it always happens. It's a constant thing. The products don't change. Bring me an actual new thing and I'm ready to talk about it. But this, cha- I mean, a few people trade some money and a few, and look, and more power to them. Some people make some money. So that's all great. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist at heart. I have no problem with people making money, but who cares who owns who? Right. Like it's, it's sort of an element of like, ah, okay. It's a bunch of investors moving money around on a balance sheet. You're not actually changing anything. Oh, but don't, you don't see that Salesforce trying to come down into the, you know, into the IT services delivery, you know, model. That's kind of, I mean, they've kind of sort of had it, but. Show me evidence that it's happening. I'm watching for it, but, but I don't view the M and A activity as enough to tell me that it's going to happen. It's, it's interesting sure uh it's a it's something to keep an eye on but in terms of my day-to-day in execution not so much and it's and and every single time any of these m&a's have 12 to 18 months of company integrations yeah so the day the deal happens who cares you're 12 months out from knowing whether or not they're going to do anything with it so just don't just don't worry about it like you know worry about it when they do something versus when they buy something all right fair it's good advice what else are we missing man so we had we had a lot of stuff we talked about but what other recent news is like definitely noteworthy you know, I, we've, we've covered a lot of the big stuff here. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of these, these pieces. Um, I think, that, you know, the, the main thing for me is, is still, I, I am, despite like my elements of like, we have some actual challenges, I'm quite bullish on this space. Like I am quite bullish on the service provider space. I think it's a really important space. Um, I think, you know, I, I want to be realistic about it. Like I want people to understand, like if I was an investor, I actually like say this is not a massive return on your investment. You want to like people, businesses are not big money in terms of a, like an investment, but man, they make great businesses. If you're a business owner, like it's first off, you can start with the, you can actually change things. Like you can make a real difference in people's lives. You can make a difference in your customers' lives. You can make a difference in your employees' lives. Like it's a really cool business to do something with. But additionally, I love the model of like re- of recurring revenue services is a really powerful way to build that asset that continues to pay, right? Yep. You're an owner of that business. You're, 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 you're continuing to run that business. So I love this space for those reasons. I just want to make sure that people are doing moves that think that way over the long term. If you're playing this to, to pop for some big sale, let me dash your hopes. That's not the way this goes. But if you're building a stable, good business that helps your community, that helps your people, that helps your employees, that helps your, your customers, and you're making money at the same time, man, I love this space. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, I, I agree with you too. I think the space is actually in a good position despite the current – I think the current situation fast-forwarded technology as, a, as not just a tool, uh, but as a legitimate business dependency, right? Like instead yeah. of duct taping it, I think people realize that they need a car that runs and runs well. Um, we've, we've had like a 10-year jump in the way people think 
in the past three months. Like we've, we really have, you really can say we are now 10 years ahead on a lot of the thinking. And I look, and I'm, I'm super sympathetic to people that are still, their heads are spinning on that because things change, did shift really fast. But you need to think about where your, your business was, was going to be in 10 years because you're kind of in that environment now. And you want to now say, well, okay, what's directionally the way I want to go for the next 10? Sure. No, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. I think it's, uh, there, there will be some winners that come out of this, Dave. There will oh, be some companies totally. that like, totally crush it coming out of this thing. Like, I mean, lean in, the ones that come out lean and mean are going to, and, and who've managed this are going to be strong and they are going to just crush it. <laughs> and, and so I just look at it and say, if I can do my bit to help as many people be in that group as possible, uh, I, I can sleep with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that, you know, smart business manage. So let's, let's round up the whole thing. Smart. Uh, number one, regulations coming. Let's get ahead of it. Number two, manage your business smart, double down on making sure that the math is constantly being recrunched, figure out where you're at. So you have a direction and you're not just winging it. But then number three, if you actually couple number one and number two, that could actually prevent the drive by night shack on the side of the road guy that says he's an MSP or an IT service provider. That's really not qualified. Right. Oh yeah. It actually could fix that problem, which is chronic that just come, comes back over and over again. So right, I'm, exactly. not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, deter people from going into the business, but there's an investment that needs to be made in order. Well, to be- we're not deterring people from the business. The bar just is raised. The bar, yeah. like it, it was way easier 20 years ago to start this kind of business out. It's yeah. not anymore. The barrier to entry is harder. We do look a lot more like doctors than we did 20 years ago. We can't just hang out a shingle. We should recognize that. Here's yeah. the, here's the bar you've got to get to be able to do this kind of business. It's not nothing. No, I, I, I 100% agree with you. And then and then it's worth re-mentioning, hey, get ahead on data management, data collection, data privacy, because that's like bleeding edge right now. And if you can figure that part out, you kind of can set your own price. Oh, it's a, it's a great space. It's a totally great space. And people will, if you're working with your customers to, to maximize the value of the data they're co- being collecting and they're doing it you know and you're you're driving that bottom line with them man they will just open the checkbook (laughs) they will just open the checkbook with you it's a very strategic conversation it's not about whether the server is running yeah i i I, we're we're beyond that because by the way let me just observe i don't even need to answer that i can throw it in the cloud i don't have to answer that question so let's move on from that question (laughs) Uh, Dave, where do people find you? You talked about a couple of videos. I want to re-mention. You talked about if you were to restart your MSP, well, what would that look like? You had a couple of other videos you mentioned about, you know, um, some of the more topical stuff that we touched on. And you said, hey, go to my YouTube page. Where? Where? Yeah. Is it? So everything is linked right off of MSPRadio.com. So you go to MSPRadio.com. There's a big blue subscribe to the Business of Tech button. When you click it, you'll get links to my podcast on every platform that you might be interested in catching it on, and my YouTube channel, which will direct, which you can subscribe to. Videos come out usually on Mondays. If people are interested in getting like early access to the content as well as I answer questions from patrons and they drive my content you can go to again you can go to that site there's a big patreon link at the top and you can join my community that's where where the information gets created but I publish it for everybody if you find value in it then I'll ask people to contribute but that's what I'm out here doing awesome and Victor hey the Rams had their shot man they should have (laughs) Super Bowl one I don't know what happened and I hear, and Victor, you're also coughing Montreal Expos. Man, my, my Nats are the World Series champions. So, you know, uh, you guys can all roll your eyes. Who's holding the trophy right now? Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, I can't, I can't change the facts. It is what it is. <laughs> so, All right, everyone. Well, thanks for watching. I appreciate everyone for joining today. Dave, I appreciate you for jumping on. I want to make this a regular thing, right? Because, like, you know, the news is always popping. So. Oh, I, lo- I love hopping on. I love doing it. And I love hearing from everybody. If you've got questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and chat. Awesome. Enjoy your uh, holiday weekend, and we'll see you guys on the other side. Take it easy, guys.